All right, so now we're going to talk about kind of one of the put a big wrinkle in this whole process. So photorespiration probably sounds like something, oh, that sounds good. It's like photo, light, respiration. Oh, that sounds good. Photorespiration is generally speaking bad. So photorespiration happens because stomata, if you remember, those are the pores on the underside of the leaf that allow gases to come in and out of the leaf. And the problem is when it's hot and dry, the plant has to worry about I'm using anthropomorphic language, but the plant will basically close the stomata to keep from drying out and dying. And the problem is then it can't exchange gas with the air around it. So what happens is over time, the photosynthetic apparatus will actually use up the carbon dioxide. It will fix all of it into sugars. And so when you get below about 50 parts per million and currently um, carbon dioxide levels are around 400 parts per million. It's actually quite elevated from what it used to be, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but as the carbon dioxide drops, you get photorespiration. And the reason for this, as we talked about, rubisco is rivulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. So it can also act as an oxygenase. And when it does that, it will fix oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. And the problem is this is bad as far as the plant is concerned. It has to expend a bunch of enzymes and energy and time to basically get rid of the stuff that's left behind. And some of the chemicals are actually um, poisonous to parts of the photosynthetic apparatus. Some of the other enzymes are actually inhibited by them, so that's bad. So this is actually an image. This is a space filling image of ribulose one 5 bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, also known as Rubisco. So here's the process. So the normal process is up here, carboxylase, we get 3 PGA, we get our 3 carbon compound, we go woohoo, that's awesome. When we get oxygenase, instead of getting a 3 carbon compound, we get this funny thing and we end up with glycolate. And this is one of these compounds that can actually slow down photosynthesis. This can go on to the Calvin cycle, but basically we didn't fix any carbon, we're essentially losing carbon and that's bad. So this is actually an outline of the whole process of basically getting rid of glycolate. So I mentioned the peroxisome, we talked about it. So glycolate goes in here, basically we get um, H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide, also very damaging. So then we have to have catalyzed to get rid of that. We have to go over to the mitochondrion. We're releasing a little bit of CO2 back. We've got NADH. Um, actually being picked up and then being expended over here. Then we're expending some ATP all the way to get back to the Calvin cycle. So it's really, really crazy. So basically, you know, this, this is a bad thing. So you might say, well, why haven't plants figured out a way to get around this problem? And, and to some extent they have, although not all plants. There's actually a fairly small number of them. One of the ways of getting around this is something called C4 photosynthesis. So this is the four carbon pathway. So if you remember, I just talked about um, in normal photosynthesis, the initial carbon fixed is C C3. It has three carbons. These guys actually start with four carbons. Now they still use Rubisco because for whatever reason, nothing has really figured out anything that's better than Rubisco at doing what it does but it adds basically an extra step on top of it. Um, C4 plants have something called Krantz anatomy. Basically it's this wreath shape. So this wreath shape is got these, these cells, the bundle sheath cells. So this is the vascular bundle. This will actually transmit water and nutrients through the leaf, which we haven't learned about yet, but we will, well, we are right now. Um, xylem and phloem, so it's going to transport, this is the plumbing of the leaf, and these are the cells that go around it. And the cells that go around it, these have actually specialized to essentially split the two halves of photosynthesis, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle, to be in different cells. So we've got large chloroplasts with few to no grana, that's those membranes in the bundle sheath cells, and then we've got smaller chloroplasts with very well-developed grana in the mesophyll cells. So they've split these two halves. So you might guess these mesophyll cells, if they've got well-developed grana, grana, that's those membranes, that's where the light reactions take place. So these are gonna be specialized in the light reactions, 
these are going to be specialized in the Calvin cycle because they don't have very many grana. And they've got these relatively large cells. They've got lots of stroma. So lots of stroma, that's where all those enzymes are. That's where Rubisco is. So this is where the carbon fixation is going to take place. And you might say, first of all, why does that help? So first of all, you're releasing oxygen in the light reactions. So you keep oxygen over here. And then we don't have to deal with oxygen over here because we're not doing the light reactions. So we don't produce as much oxygen there. Um, but there's actually an extra step that they do, which makes this even more efficient. So C4 plants have an extra enzyme, PEP carboxylase. So this is another important enzyme. I, I said I'd only have you guys remember um, Rubisco, but this is one that's specific to C4. So C4, PEP carboxylase, is basically going to take this carbonic acid and it's going to fix it into oxaloacetate, malate, and aspartate. So it's actually going to bind these up into these organic acids. So it can do this. Basically what it does is it's going to concentrate carbon dioxide. Why is this important? Because PEP carboxylase, notice it's just carboxylase. It's not oxygenase. And that means it's not confused. This enzyme doesn't get confused by high levels of oxygen. So it's going to concentrate the CO2. And what cells is it going to concentrate this in? Hmm. Well, initially, it's actually going to fix it in the mesophyll cells. And the reason for that, we go back one. This is the stomate. So this is where the gas is going to come in. So the initial place where carbon dioxide is going to land is right here. So the PEP carboxylase is actually going to act here, but those organic acids are going to be transported to these cells because this is where the Calvin cycle is going to take place. And those organic acids will actually be turned back into carbon dioxide once they get over here. So this is a um, electron micrograph diagram from your textbook that shows this. So here we've got C CO2, we've got oxaloacetate, PP carboxylase, it's going to be turned into malate. Notice we're using some NADPH to do this. So we get all the way over here, we're transporting malate, use some NADPH, we go back to CO2, and of course what enzyme is going to carry out this reaction? It's still going to be Rubisco. So Rubisco will still um, carry out the Calvin cycle just like normal. The only thing that's different is the light reactions are over here, so the NADPH and ATP have to be transported over here, and the organic acids have to be transported over here. But you notice that the chloroplasts here are very different. They have very few grana, versus over here they have these super thick, very active grana right here. So light reactions are taking place in the mesophyll cell. This is the bundle sheath cell. So it's split up, and now we've got the Calvin cycle taking place over here. So it's really a neat process. So this is kind of an overview. So a lot of this takes place in grasses, although not all grasses are C4. A lot of them are not. A lot of them are C3. Um, there are some economically important grasses that are C4, for example, sugarcane, um, but also corn and a couple of others. Um, but wheat is a C3 grass. So right here we've got CO2 coming in. We have that C4 pathway. That's the capturing of those enzymes with PEP carboxylase, turning them into organic acids like malate and oxaloacetate. Then it goes through. It's going to transport that to the bundle sheath cell where they can be used. We've got Rubisco. Rubisco is still going to grab carbon dioxide, do the Calvin cycle like normal. That's what happens in the bundle sheath cells. That's C4 photosynthesis. So you might say, well, why don't all plants do this? Again, because the C4 pathway actually costs a little bit of energy to do this. Now, I also said that this is mostly found in grasses. Um, there are C3, um, we haven't talked about them yet, but there are C3 dicots. That's a whole, the other group of um, angiosperms. So here's, here's the deal, is there's kind of a competition. So light intensity versus increase in photosynthesis. So at low light, you notice that the C3 plant actually has 
a better photosynthetic rate than the C4 plant. However, if you get high enough light intensity, the C4 plant is actually be able to respond to it more. So you're going to find a C4 plant usually in a very bright um, open location. So a lot of prairie um, grasses and grassland plants are C4 plants. And then we can look over here, same thing with temperature. So as temperature increases, um, the C3 plant it goes down. The C4 plant doesn't really matter as far as temperature because it can concentrate that carbon dioxide. Um, it can keep its stomata open for a lot longer. So also relatively hot, dry, open, that's the kind of places you're going to find um, more C4 plants versus C3 plants. But the thing to know is that in terms of the number of species on Earth, there are far more C3 plants. That's that normal photosynthesis without the extra steps. Um, then there are C4 plants. So there's one other wrinkle to this, which is CAM photosynthesis. CAM photosynthesis is kind of the even more extreme form of photosynthesis that allows plants to survive in dry environments. So this you're going to find in something like succulents, especially cacti and things. Um, it's fairly common um, in a lot of house plants. So they're actually going to be able to survive really, really dry environments. So what they do is because they have, they've now split, um, well, they don't really split their parts of photosynthesis. They use those same enzymes that we saw in the C4 that can capture CO2. But what they do is they do it at night. So at nighttime, it's cooler, usually a little bit more moist. So if you're a desert plant, that's the time to open your stomata, so you're not going to lose as much water. Of course, the problem is you can't do photosynthesis at night. So instead, they're using our good friend PEP carboxylase again, and it's going to bind up all of the stuff into acids. That's actually what the name is. The name of this it stands for crassulation acid metabolism. Because people that were studying these, they noticed that the tissue of these plants um, became more acidic at night. So basically these guys are going to grab onto the CO2, they're going to bind it up as acids, and then during the day when the stomata is closed, they can take all of that acid, turn it back into CO2, and then basically carry on photosynthesis as usual with rubisco and all those types of things. So really useful for plants that are dealing with really low um, levels of water and lots of light.